recognize our board host at the head table, Marlene Bayless Mitchell, who as board host, member of the Board of Governors, will have the privilege of asking the first question of our speaker. <clears throat> The relationship between the United States and Canada is truly something special. We have the longest unfortified international boundary in the world. We have powerful economic ties through our bilateral trade. And we have similar historical, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds. But even good neighbors sometimes find their respective interests at variance. An example from the eastern part of the country is Canada's claim that air pollution from the United States is poisoning Canada's lakes. And an example from the western part is the claim by the United States lumber producers that Canadian policies are unfairly subsidizing Canadian competition. It is vital to both countries that such problems be handled by skillful negotiation that does not disrupt our mutual beneficial relationship. We are fortunate to have with us today a Canadian Foreign Service officer who brings both skill and experience to such assignments. The Honorable Alan D. Rowe was graduated from Northwestern University in Illinois. He received a master's degree from the University of Toronto. He was a journalist and in radio and television production in Canada, the West Indies, and Western Europe, and he then entered the Canadian Diplomatic Service. He served in Canadian embassies in Beirut, Lebanon, and Havana, Cuba, both spots without, uh, with some difficulties, I could imagine. Attended the National Defense College, and then was posted to the United Nations at Geneva, where he was Canada's representative to the Conference on Disarmament and the officer responsible for Canada's relations with the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. He served at the headquarters of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and then as Deputy Director, Consular Policy Division for the Department of External Affairs at Ottawa. Since 1983, he has been Canadian Consul for Political and Economic Relations at Seattle, Washington, with responsibilities in the states of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Alaska. In that capacity, he participated in the negotiations of the Skagit River Treaty and also the Pacific Salmon Treaty. Mr. Rowe will discuss free trade or protectionism in U.S.-Canada relations. We are delighted to have him with us. Mr. Rowe. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a, a great honor and I'm indebted to the governor and the officers of the City Club and your executive director, Nina Johnson, for the distinct honor of speaking to you today. Now my subject is current. It is vital to the future relationships of our two countries. How you view this subject now and after this brief encounter and what you decide to do about it and of some of the problems I'll touch upon will be important. It's important because your decisions and those of your political and economic leaders will impact directly on you, your businesses, your families, and the state of Oregon. And I know that some of you already are thinking and may have thought when you saw the advanced copy of the program, hey, this is going to be real heavy duty stuff after a delicious lunch and on a Friday afternoon already. But it's obvious from the City Club's consideration of that resolution a few moments ago that you are used to dealing with heavy duty stuff and you're used to participating actively and intensely on subjects which concern you and your community and your country. Now we live in a world which, as news from France comes in in the last day or two and elsewhere, a world which is changing dramatically, dynamically, and very disturbingly for all of us. I'm a father of two sons. They're both in their early 20s. 
And I'm concerned about their future, but I'm also captivated by their imagination and their optimism. And by the world that they will make for themselves will be built on what we do with our world. Now, if I sound like the proverbial preacher, in a way, I guess I am, because I've addressed something like 20 or 30 audiences, very much like yourselves, in the Pacific Northwest in Alaska. Because the message I'd like to bring to you today concerns a revival, a very necessary revival, a very immediate revival of interest in that great land mass to your immediate north, Canada. Because our interests, our aspirations, and our destiny are closely and inexorably linked with yours. We are more than the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who, I know from personal experience, don't always catch their man, or in today's parlance, their person. We do have Eskimos who still sit outside of hand-built igloos and puff on sandstone pipes. We do export moosehead beer, and I suggest you try it, although there are days in Portland I prefer Henry's. <laughs> and we do export that delicious Alberta Express weather during the winter across the longest undefended and I would suggest unappreciated boundary in the world. One of your more eloquent presidents, John F. Kennedy, said in the Parliament of Canada during his first state visit to our country, in describing Canada and America, geography has made us neighbors, history has made us friends, economics has made us partners, and necessity has made us allies. Now, I don't have time today to talk about our joint efforts in the defense of freedom and democracy, our joint efforts in North America and the North America Air Defense System, that America and Canada were founding members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and that loved ones of my families and your families lost their lives in two great wars, and the war that we quickly forget, the Korean War. I want to talk about basic political and economic facts of life which illustrate how profoundly our two economies and our lives are intertwined. I'm going to begin with some economic trivia. I'm also going to remind you that trivia was dropped into this speech now because Trivial Pursuit was invented in Canada by some unemployed Canadians. <laughs> they still may not be unemployed or even employed in the classical sense, but I can assure you that their accountants are well employed in handling the millions they've made from this game. That's a real success story, eh? A North American success story. Now I'll add one more plug while I'm at it. Please come to Canada before the middle of October to Vancouver and see Expo 86. What about the statistics? Now I'm going to speak slowly here at dictation speed. America and Canada enjoy the largest trading relationship in the world. Two-way trade in 1985 was 123 billion American dollars. Now I hear a quiet, insistent voice in the back saying, hey, what about that trade surplus in Canada's favor? I'll get to that in a moment. I'll also talk about beer, steel, raspberries, American corn, shakes and shingles, and say something about two by fours, four by fours, and Canadian softwood. I also, in parentheses, would comment that wheat sales to the USR by America has upset very badly the Canadians of the west of our country. Now, your trade with Canada surpasses by a very wide margin your trade with Japan. American trade with Canada is more than your total trade with the entire economic community of Western Europe. Your trade with Canada is more than the total trade of Britain, the Federal Republic of Germany, and France combined by more than $55 billion. Your trade with Canada in 1985 your trade with the single province of Ontario, Canada, in 1985 was larger than your total trade with your second largest trading partner, Japan. American trade with Canada in 1984 and 1985 with the province of British Columbia, that's Expo again, was larger than your trade with the People's Republic of China. Now I'm gonna take 10 seconds here to allow you to assimilate those facts and for me to taste, to toast Portland, but also to taste one of your earlier export products, 
Portland city water. It's very good. America and Canada were each other's growing markets, fastest growing markets in the recent years. Our exports to you rose by 28.8% in 1984. You matched that with a 26.4% rise in your exports to Canada. What about Oregon? Your state fits in as follows. Oregon exported to Canada in 1985 goods worth $320,480,000. You bought from Canada goods worth $392,300,000. Now what did you ship to Canada? You shipped lumber to Canada. Yes, you did in 1985, to the tune of $60 million. You ship motor vehicle parts, electronic computers, trucks, chassis, specialized machinery, electrical measuring instruments, plywood and building boards, more wood, $10.8 million worth. And what our statisticians on both sides of the border call crude vegetable products. That's crude, not obscene. It means Oregon fruits, vegetables, horticultural products, because horticulture is one of your state's largest thriving industries. What did we ship to you? We ship lumber, yes. Petroleum and coal products, more trucks, wood pulp, fertilizers, organic chemicals, motor vehicle parts, and over $10.3 million worth of Canadian meat, fresh, chilled, and frozen. Now, under petroleum products, I should mention specifically Canadian natural gas, because of the states of Oregon, Idaho, and Washington, 40% of your little blue flame is Canadian gas. Now, for one sore note, in 1985, we exported to your state $20.8 million worth of shakes and shingles. That changed dramatically this year in July, and I'll get back to that concerning your administration's decision to impose a 35% tariff on that Canadian product and our reaction. Now, these facts and figures, I trust, will show you that we have an intricate, intertwined, and interdependent economic relationship, which of course means politically we have an intermingling of decision-making, as well as in the defense and indeed in the social areas. Now the stakes are very high. Take tourism, for example. After the golden Californian tourists to your state, Canadians with their gold comprise Oregon's second most important tourist group. Tourists require disposable income. Therefore, if the health of the Canadian economy is in any way diminished by actions beyond our control, less income, less travel, less tourism. Now what about the subtopics I referred to before? There was a point in my career that I thought subtopics were subjects discussed underwater. And underwater gets me onto another subject very briefly, and that's the U.S.-Canada Pacific Salmon Treaty, which with political will on both sides of the border was ratified, was signed, and was passed. One of the few laws in the American federal legislature passed with an overwhelming majority by the Senate because it was good for both countries. From Alaska to Northern California, we are now catching salmon again. And we will be catching salmon for the future of our children and our children's children because we have agreed together to put aside our differences and to manage that natural resource together. What about the deficit? What about the debt? That affects trade. Now Canada's national debt, this will be cold comfort to you, Canada's national debt per capita is higher than that of America. You're worried. We're extremely worried. We're also attempting to restructure government expenditures, government revenues to reduce that debt. Now, there is a disagreement which is a statistical disagreement that I'd like to talk to you very briefly about. The question of where do we stand on trade, bilateral trade. At the moment, senior negotiators appointed by President Reagan and by Prime Minister Mulroney are discussing and negotiating ways and means by which the last barriers to freer trade between our two countries can be reduced or eliminated. 
Now they have a problem, as many of us have a problem, in reconciling figures. In 1985, American figures showed only $45.7 billion worth of exports to Canada. Our import figures in trade with America totaled $52.9 billion, and that's quite a difference. Now there was a recalculation done, as there is done, very quietly but insistently at the end of each fiscal or trading year, where America agreed, the Department of Commerce, that the figure really was, for 1985, $52.1 billion. Now that is $8 billion more in exports shipped to Canada than America had figured in its earlier statistics earlier in the year. Now this is a question of merchandise trade, where you measure gidgets and widgets and goods and services. But public knowledge of the total import-export trade in America is not as acute as we feel it should be. There's another trade, as every businessman in this room is aware of. It is an invisible trade to most people. It's a trade in transactions which are financial. The movement of investment dollars, of capital, of dividends to and fro across our border. Now that ebb and flow of immense wealth in many sectors is of far greater value to our respective economies because it's creating wealth for the future than just goods. But it's invisible to a good number of people, including some of your eminent public spokesmen as they get ready for November. A Canadian investment syndicate that buys or builds a commercial or residential complex in Portland or Eugene or Grants Pass is moving immense capital into the United States. They are shipping dividends back to Canada. An American company and many of your leading softwood lumber companies have immense operations in Canada where they move American cap uh, to Canada, produce dividends and profits in Canada, and that comes back to enrich the American economy. Now traditionally, yes, we have run a surplus on the merchandise or the goods trade with the United States. But what about the services trade? We have run traditionally a deficit. In 1985, that deficit for Canada was $6.1 billion. So if you combine the two, goods on one side and services on the other, you come up with what they call the current account. Now the current account balance for 1985 was only $7.1 billion in Canada's favor. Now that is a long way from what is being said in America, in American statistics, that the trade deficit with Canada is $21.7 billion. It is only 6.1. Now my dullest pencil and my slowest calculation would indicate an error when discussing trade in its totality an error of $14.6 billion. Now my wife handles finances in our house and if I made a mistake of $14.6, I think she would have a small fit. $14.6 billion is a long way off what we would consider to be the true picture. Now, when someone talks about deficits with another country, please look at the current account with Canada or any of your other trading partners so that you truly in your own mind know exactly what is the surplus and in whose favor that surplus might be. Now the list of trade complaints between Canada and the United States that our negotiators are looking at right now are long on the American side and equally long on the Canadian side. Our two leaders agreed at two summits, one in Quebec City and one in Washington earlier this year, that the best thing they could do was to eliminate to the extent possible and as quickly as possible all remaining barriers between our two countries, tariffs and duties. Now if these bilateral negotiations are successful, they will be the most important development in world trade liberalization in the final years of this century. And that is not an exaggeration. We in diplomacy are not noted for exaggerating. It's exciting because the countries that are meeting now in Uruguay of the GATT, the General Agreement of Treaties and Tariffs, are looking at our two countries to set an example 
Because if we cannot agree on how to trade fairly and openly with each other, how on earth are we going to compete with the rest of the world? What could be the benefits for America and for Oregon with a liberalized trade with Canada? A possible growth of 10% in computers and peripherals, 6% in telecommunications, 4% in horticultural products, construction machinery, plastics, electronic components. In every one of those categories, there's a product which is made in Oregon. For Canada, liberalized trade will mean similar increases in as wide a range of goods and services and in an atmosphere of equality in the North American market. For both sides, there will be extreme difficulties. There will be changes of dramatic intent in industries. There will be shifts in the evol evolution of certain industries. The current short-term problems are not insurmountable when one considers the medium to long-range benefits of prosperity on both sides of the border. Knock on wood that no one in this room has a two by four and a grudge against Canada, let's move to wood. The first round of a protectionist nature in Canada-US relations on wood came about with shakes and shingles. That's one of the most favorite building materials used widely in the United States and, Pacific, and, and particularly in the Western states. In June of this year, without notice to Canada, your government imposed a 35% duty on shakes and shingles with the belief, perhaps, that Canada would not react. Now, we did by imposing duties on a wide variety of American products, books, periodicals, semiconductors, and computer parts, plus Christmas trees. Now, that 35% American tariff brought nothing close to the prosperity expected by those who proposed it. One must remember that the production of shakes and shingles in the Pacific Northwest has depended to a significant extent on old growth, straight grain, red cedar from British Columbia. And after the tariff was imposed, do you think that British Columbia shipped any logs or blocks across the border? No. That meant that all raw material for the American shakes and shingles producers had to be found in the Pacific Northwest. Now those of you who happen to know something about forestry, and I'm not an expert, will know that old growth, straight grained, blemish free cedar is not necessarily easily available in the Pacific Northwest. Check the prices. What would it cost you today to put a new cedar roof on your home of American cedar shingles compared to what it might have cost you last year when the border was open? Who gained from the protection? The large companies in the Pacific Northwest gained. They are gaining because they had stockpiled red cedar. They have access to their own red cedar. But the smaller operations, <laughs> whose future prosperity was intended by the tariff have not done well at all. Now let's talk about softwood lumber, dimensional lumber for a moment. But I'll add one more important statistic for your lunch and napkin notes. The US Department of Labor estimates that over two million, two million American workers depend for their entire livelihood on trade in goods and services with Canada. How many more could be working, or looking at it pessimistically, may not be working, depending on whether we agree to expand our trade or to protect? Now, Canada is once again on trial in Washington, D.C. for the second time as a defendant in a second countervail duty investigation regarding softwood lumber. We find it difficult to understand why a second investigation was initiated. The petition filed by American softwood lumber interests dealt with essentially the same issues that were examined minutely and at great expense three years ago. The American Administrative ITC-ITA Tribunal concluded then 
that there were no subsidies in the matter of stumpage being provided in Canada. The case was closed in 1983, and very significantly for us and others who followed that, the petitioners in 1983 did not exercise their right of appeal. Three years later, no material changes in Canadian forestry practices, no changes in U.S. countervail trade law, no interpretations of U.S. law that would bear on a second investigation and suddenly we're back in the dock. The investigation imposes an enormous and expensive burden on taxpayers on both sides of the border. It slows down investment because people don't want to invest in an insecure industry. And it is a form in Canada's view of trade harassment. Canada is being tried twice on the same accusation. And in law, I would suggest that double jeopardy is inconsistent with natural justice. And we have already registered our representations to the GATT in Geneva on those terms. Now, why is Canadian Softwood doing so well in the United States market? These are American factors. One, the higher value of the United States dollar. Two, the higher level of productivity in many Canadian mills which have been modernized over the recent years. Three, the admitted higher quality of much of the Canadian product and the demonstrated preference for it by builders across America who choose, even at a premium, Canadian spruce, fir and pine from our north woods, they choose it in a free market environment. The complexity of American forest management and utilization, especially in the Pacific Northwest, you have attendant costs of standing timber, labor, capital, certain tax advantages which are not available to Canadian producers. These are American problems. A number of your political and industrial leaders have said time and time again that there is a drastic reformation required of American forestry practices in order to become more competitive, not only with Canada, but with the rest of the world. There are factors of transportation which are American. How many in this room are aware of the Jones Act? The Jones Act dictates how American ocean-borne cargo must be transported on American ships between American ports. Now let's say you wanted to put 1,000 board feet of lumber on a ship in Portland and send it to Atlanta via the Panama Canal. The going rate today, if anyone was foolish enough to do it, on an American ship, that's the only way to ship, would be $90 per thousand board feet. From Vancouver, Canada, the identical lumber shipped to the identical American port would be $55 per thousand board feet. The difference of 55 and 90 is a result of costs because of the Jones Act. If you wanted to ship lumber from Seattle, Portland to Atlanta by American railroads, it would cost you 80 to $85 per thousand board feet. Now the law in question, the shipping costs in question, and the freight rates in question are American, they are not Canadian. Now in 1985, I was told by a census official of the United States Department of Commerce in Washington, D.C., the other Washington as we say in Seattle, that 11,297 new home permits were issued in Oregon in 1985. That's where someone builds with a permit and I assume everyone in Oregon builds with a permit. Of that, single family dwellings comprise 6,407. Now those housing starts in Oregon, as in elsewhere in America, were prompted by lower mortgage rates and the costs of building materials, of which the primary cost in America is wood. The simple formula used in the building trade is this. For every $1,000 increase in the price of an average home in America, more than 300,000 families are removed from the new home market. We've already had an increase in shakes and shingles. 
What would happen then if softwood lumber in America went up in price as a result of action taken in a U.S. tribunal vis-a-vis -vis Canadian lumber? It would mean that beyond the construction trades, workers would be unemployed who normally would be making furniture, carpets, curtains, stoves, refrigerators, and all those other goodies that all of us like to put into a brand new home. And let's not forget that entire other area, the renovation and reconstruction of older buildings. Raise the price and the projects will not go ahead. Now there are probably a dozen other factors that we could discuss in this and other areas. We could talk about steel. We are being sideswiped on steel because America has a quarrel with another country. And your system does not differentiate between friends and foes in trade. We're having problems with red raspberries from British Columbia in Washington state. American companies would like to sell more beer in Canada, more wine in Canada. We would also like to be able to sell more beef in certain parts of the United States. And the agricultural list is very long, including potatoes on the East Coast and an unresolved problem of fishing in the Gulf of Maine, despite an international court of justice decision. Now, free trade or protectionism. Protectionism has never, ever worked and never will. It costs far too much to create the sorts of jobs that are required in a protectionist environment in a protected industry. Those of you in the room that will remember Smoot and Hawley, the two gentlemen who put through that particular law in Washington, will know what happened. A thousand industries were protected immediately. And this led, and was a factor, to the 1930s collapse. Now my subject was, and still is, free trade or protectionism. And I trust, from what I have said, and how vigorously I have said it, that there is no doubt where Canada is coming from, to use an expression of today. But I wish I had time to ask each one of you where you stand. Have you even thought about these issues? With whom have you discussed them lately? There's a wide variety of opinion and decision makers in your country, just as there is in mine. They want to know what we want as taxpayers. They want to know whether we truly want short-term and costly solutions based on the expediency of the moment or long-term and mutually beneficial trading relationships freer of restrictions and thus able to contribute to the prosperity of our economies, reinforce our senses of freedom and democracy, and provide an expanding economy and therefore expanding exciting opportunities for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rowe. We certainly appreciate your bringing the Canadian point of view to our attention. It's now time for discussion and as I mentioned earlier, the privilege of asking the first question goes to our board host, Marlene Bayless Mitchell. Alan, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. I want you to know that I uh, have, have tried to contribute. I spent lots of money at Expo. <laughs> encourage the rest of you to do it too. Um, my question today is, in your talk, you referred to the ITC, International Trade Administration, review of the issue of Canadian subsidy. And um, since that, that issue is really related to the stumpage pricing systems, and in recent weeks, the Prime Minister and the Minister of Forests of British Columbia have both suggested that the stumpage pricing system needs revision. Isn't that uh, an admission that the U.S. lumbermen have been uh, uh, correct in their assessment of that situation? 
Thank you, Marlene. <clears throat> Canada, or rather British Columbia, has had a recent change of government under the parliamentary system. You can change premiers without necessarily going to an election. What has happened in British Columbia, which has been seized upon in the United States as a change in British Columbia policy, is in fact a change of administration's desire to review a wide range of British Columbia programs, of which forestry is one. And Premier van der Zam of British Columbia and his forestry minister made several announcements to the effect that they were undertaking an in-depth review of all forestry management practices in British Columbia. And of course, stumpage would be part of the forestry practices. But there was no intent in making that announcement of suggesting that indeed there were any subsidies being given in British Columbia since we had already been examined in 1983 by a not necessarily impartial tribunal in the United States. So. What will come from that review is a matter of the future. But British Columbia is reviewing, as any new government would do and any new administration would do, if they found themselves with a contentious issue on their desk, they would like to find out a little more about it. Thank you very much. We're now open for questions from the floor, and as we might expect, our <laughs> resident economist is one of the, <laughs> the first. Dan, uh, identify yourself, and uh, let me <clears throat> suggest that all of you, when you ask questions, use the microphone and identify yourselves and remain at the microphone until Mr. Rose had an opportunity to answer the question. I'm Dan Goldie, a City Club member, and Mr. Rowe, uh, may I suggest you've been a little less than candid. I have here clippings from your newspapers in Canada, and here is a column, for example, headed, Too Late to Pull the Wool Over Canny Eyes in the United States. And the reason for this column was that when Mr. Van der Zam, the new premier, and his minister of forests, said, found out that you were, they were spending $350 million a year to sell timber, but only getting $150 million in return in sales, they decided that there was a subsidy and the industry was being favored. And they were then attacked by other members, political members up there, saying in effect that they were giving the whole case away to the United States. Now my question to you is this. In addition to this admission, and they're making a study, isn't it true that your international trade minister, Pat Carney, just went to Washington and talked to our Secretary of Commerce, asked for time, more time, so that the British Columbia could in effect study how to revise their stumpage system to eliminate the subsidies, hoping that therefore they could get out from underneath the countervailing duty. And my second question is, admittedly, the very importance of trade between the US and Canada, can such trade survive if one side takes unfair advantage of another with subsidies? Um. Mr. Goldie, we've met before and we've discussed this over coffee or whatever we discussed it That's in true. Portland, I think, last year. Your question is uh, in five parts, I think. Um, and I'm going to give you an answer very slowly. My wife says sometimes I'm so slow in responding that it takes me an hour and a half to watch 60 minutes. <laughs> On the first point, which is the question of whether or not there are subsidies in the Canadian forestry practices, in this case British Columbia, the last full-scale, full-bore, million-dollar investigation of this was conducted in America and concluded in 1983. What the Premier has asked for and his forestry minister is a review of forestry practices in British Columbia. And somewhere here I have the press release from Victoria to that effect. That is true. But it strikes me that when one is a defendant before the courts, and we are talking about a judicial, quasi-judicial administrative tribunal, that one does not comment in depth on the accusations or provide ammunition for the accusers in public. I would suggest, therefore, that perhaps those newspaper articles should be checked out with 
the spokespersons who allegedly said what they said in it. Secondly, with regard to whether or not there are indeed subsidies, again, the ITC-ITA will make that determination. And they are bound and determined, and Secretary Baldrige has told us, they are bound and determined that they will issue a verdict on the 9th of October of this year. It is true that the Honorable Pat Carney asked whether that could be deferred so that if any additional evidence could come forward, that could be utilized. We had some belief that on occasion, such deadlines could be deferred in other cases not involving Canada, but I, I don't have a full transcript of Mr. Baldry's statement to know why exactly it could not be done with Canada, with America's largest trading partner as a favor, but I understand that this is not going to happen. Now that's 2.85%, two and 2 I think, of all the questions. I can't recall, were there any? There were a couple of, uh, of loaded ones. Uh, and I am, as a diplomat and as a federal civil servant and as a negotiator, I am not going to comment on what might be the reaction of an aggrieved party if they got hit by a two by four. But I have alluded to in, I trust, clear but restrained tones what happened with shakes and shingles. May I, may I just say to you here before this group, that the key point you're making about no change between the decision in 83 and now. The 83 decision turned on a very narrow point which has since been reversed by an international trade court of the United States and the Cabot case and on the basis of that revised law in the United States the new case has been brought up. Well we'll have until October the 9th to know whether there is anything new that would render a verdict other than not guilty again. Why don't you just stay here and field the right. questions Thank you. as they come? <coughs> Question. This, I am Bill Wood of City Club. I have for many years been interested in Canadian libraries in a professional manner. Uh, you brought up the point that there was an increase in Canadian tariff on American uh, books and periodicals. I have read recently in the library literature that the Canadian libraries are quite upset by this because, of course, it makes it difficult for them to purchase such materials. An ex a very considerable amount comes from the United States, of course. Now, this can cause a deficiency in knowledge and information in Canadian libraries. Do you have any comment on this? Well, my comment will be less than specific. You've touched upon uh, one particular commodity which was chosen by the Canadian cabinet to send a message. <coughs> computers and peripherals to send another message, Christmas trees, etc., to make sure that across America the message was received. That for Canadians, softwood lumber, shakes and shingles, are not two issues of a regional nature, any more than salmon was a regional nature. They are of national interest to Canadians from coast to coast. No protectionist measure or response to a protectionist measure will ever leave either side unscathed in either the producer or the consumer. And it was the last thing that my Prime Minister and Cabinet wished to do. But it has been done, and there will be people who will not be happy with that. But I suggest on the other side of the border, there will be those of you in the publishing or the wholesaling business that are finding it rather, difficulty, uh, rather difficult to ship certain periodicals and books across the border. Bob Wheel, member, would you comment on the restrictions that I understand Canada places on American ownership of businesses in certain areas of endeavor in Canada? I think publications, magazines, so on, are tightly restricted. We used to have in Canada, under the previous Liberal administration of Prime Minister Trudeau, we used to have a uh, foreign investment review committee that was quite strong in screening foreign investments. Uh, since the coming into power of Prime Minister Mulroney and the Conservative Party, that has been almost completely dismantled. We have an investment review committee, and that is a committee that will look at certain types of investments, uh, where it might be more in 
the Canadian interest to have Canadian control, but the number of negative decisions have been few and far between. And there is an area which is perhaps not completely understood uh, in America, and that is, we all have it as a matter of fact, we all have what we call a culture, a cultural sovereignty, a way of thinking, a way of publishing, a way of educating, and a way of disseminating information in our countries. And this is rather precious to Canadians because it's part of the Canadian way of life. And uh, it is precious to Americans as well. And therefore, if there is going to be any um, infringement of certain areas, then I think both sides will want to tread fairly carefully. This is not to say that all subjects are not subject to on the table to discussion. And that is indeed the invitation that we extended to America through our new Prime Minister. Whatever troubles you, put it on the bargaining table and let's have a look at it. But as far as investment is concerned in Canada, I don't have the exact figures, but the investment has gone up by leaps and bounds. And Canada is a very open country for investment. Canada is also an extremely open country with regard to exports, particularly in the goods and services that America needs, whether it's hydroelectricity, whether it's coal, or certainly natural gas to places like California. I threw in that export. Are there any more questions? It's an extremely complex subject, and um, I am, again, very grateful to have had this opportunity of sharing my thoughts with you. And thank you again very, very much. And thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Rowe, for sharing your thoughts with us. We are adjourned until next week.